I'll just um, quick announcement since we do have quite a number of people here. We'll get started in about two minutes. If you feel so inclined, we're sharing our local temperatures and times since this is a good variety happening in this session so far. Um, and feel free to switch over to the Whova app chat there. Um, if you will make an announcement about that once we start, but that is the preferred chat area. Should I get started or do we want to give it a minute? <laughs> Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, in this session of the TADWIG 2021 virtual conference. This is uh, session 14 entitled Community Building for Our Shared Data Future. I'm your moderator, Holly Little. My co-moderator is Rebecca Snyder, and we're grateful for the tech support from the University of Florida conference team. Thank you all again for joining us, and thank you to all the speakers in this session. Each presenter will present for 10 minutes. There will be three minutes of questions at the each of each, end of each presentation and two minutes to transition between presenters. This session will be recorded for later viewing and continued engagement throughout the week. During both the talks and the panel session, please ask questions using the Q&A feature in Whova, and these will be asked of the presenters or panelists by a co-moderator. Throughout the session, you can interact within Whova as that space will be preserved beyond our two hour block we have now and enable discussion throughout the week. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see the Chadwig Code of Conduct document for more information. We will have a panel discussion at the end of the session to delve further into the topic and continue to address any questions that we might not have time for between talks. Please bear with any technical difficulties we may have and enjoy the session. Before switching over, I wanna share a bit more details about the topic that we have at hand for the session. The theme of this year's conference is connecting the world of biodiversity data, uniting people, processes, and tools. As you can see here, our session concentrates on the people aspect of that and includes a range of perspectives on community building with different types of communities, different approaches, and at various scales from local efforts to the larger global landscape. We hope you might see across these though, is that the coordination and overlap between and how each community discussed flows into one another is how we can continue to drive progress and growth in our shared data landscape. Next, please. Thinking about what we mean by community, one aspect might be a series of shared collective goals that many of us and the initiatives we participate in have in common and we recognize the importance of working together to achieve them. From contributing to larger efforts around climate change and biodiversity loss, 
to making our data as fair and useful as possible, and to engaging broader, more inclusive, and diverse audiences. At a high level, we need to ensure we connect not just our biological specimens, their associated data together, and the people who manage these data, but also include the full spectrum of natural history, including the geosciences and anthropology collections, information, and practitioners. We see the key aspects of this concept of a proactive, intentional community as collaboration, communication, coordination, and cross-function. So with the presentations and discussions today, we'll consider how can we work together to make this a functional reality? What models of community building can we use at the local and global scales to further our collaboration? And how can we collectively improve sharing of best practices, expertise, and capacity? So to get us started, I'm gonna pass over to Rebecca. You are muted. Classic. Okay, so given that big picture and perspective on community, we wanted to start the session with a very localized approach from work that we're doing at our home institution, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, or NMNH. Um, our museum, we are currently undergoing a reevaluation and reshaping of how we support and approach informatics work related to our research and collections. And although this is primarily an internal exercise touching on some pretty specific log logistics of how our own museum operates, um, we recognize from the outset that the evolution of our informatics capacity and structure had to align and be guided by this larger global informatics landscape. Our work so far has focused on the critical role of people, relationships, um, and community in establishing a strong foundation to, that, uh, to work and share from. Uh, we also want to make sure that we balance uh, internal community building efforts with the larger global community. Um, this global natural history and biodiversity data landscape is a complicated one, full of initiatives, organizations, government programs, and institutions, all with unique but sometimes overlapping mandates and best practices. For NMNH, the diagram of our global participation looks something like this, which indicates some but not all of the initiatives that we work closely with. However, this diagram only focuses on formal partnerships with institutions and programs, which are certainly vital, but they're not the complete picture. We also need to focus on the communities that lie within and between these groups that we engage with as a museum and also through individual efforts. And diagramming these relationships looks very tidy on paper, but the reality is another thing. Um, while we participate globally, we don't necessarily do so in a in coordinated way internally. We have many pockets of informatics expertise and capacity spread out across our museum and the Smithsonian, each with their own participation in formal and informal communities. And again, this is non-exhaustive. Um, so I'm sure you all recognize um, the pattern here. We have in silos, inconsistent communication, miscollaborative opportunities, basically all the classic issues. Um, if NMNH's goal is to have more intentional participation and collaboration, we cannot continue under this model. So knowing informatics is a crucial um, component of all that we do within NMNH and is a catalyst for our participation in the broader global landscape, we must adapt and change. So for the past year, Natural History has been reevaluating our informatics capacity and structure and taking advantage of a series of recommendations from a 2020 visiting committee that provided an in-depth review of science, including informatics specifically. A task force that was led by Holly and I spent the past 10 months um, on research, data gathering, and developing a proposal to address the visiting committee's recommendations and our museum strategic plan and known development needs. The three primary results um, based on our work focused on centralizing and expanding capacity, enabling innovation, and the focus of this talk, which is creating a community of practice that focuses on both internal and external community, community building. Our proposal brings these concepts together through the creation of an informatics and data science center, which we're calling IDISC for short. We see IDISC as a hub for in informatics innovation, collaboration, and support that consolidates expertise and workflows. Launching the center will both unify existing core informatics staff that are currently distributed as you saw in the diagram, um, but also provide a second home for the other staff 
across our museum and the Smithsonian. This home is developed by the community of practice model. By intentionally building coordination, training and opportunities to work together, we foster an environment that encourages communication and allows for multiple levels of engagement. And that's excellent notions in theory, but how do we turn that into practice? To help us learn more about possible models, um, as part of our task force activities, we talked with a series of institutions and museums about their organization, how informatics was structured, and how they worked together internally. These insightful conversations provided a lot of information that will inform the implementation of iDisc. At the risk of oversimplification, several common themes were threaded across our conversations. There's no one right model. Successes take many forms. People, not structure, are the key. Over and over and over, we heard that a successful program came from having the right people and support. This was also sometimes a source of anxiety, as the loss of someone could derail a program. So how do you build a people-centric community that can be sustained long term? While community building had organically developed in pockets by invested persons, also value in more intentional and sustainable efforts. We also learned about a few strategies that have worked well, from working groups and brown bags, to even the importance of shared physical working space, which is kind of funny to talk about in our current environment. Um, but these are all things we want to try ourselves. Overall, everyone we talked to was interested in these conversations and learning from each other and how to keep the communication and collaborations going. We're hoping that this session that we're in right now will contribute to these findings more and help us answer some of these questions. Next. Following these conversations and our findings, as mentioned by Rebecca, NMNH determined that a community of practice model would best suit our needs and enable a balance between formal structure where needed and space for informal coordination and growth. This model will help NMNH sustainably scale informatics capacity and effort beyond the core IDIS group, bringing in the whole museum, Smithsonian, and external partners. Establishing a strong foundation rooted in our community is critical to the success of informatics and the new center at our museum. There must be broad engagement and a sense of belonging for members of our local community and a clear way for members of the global community to connect with and collaborate with us. Through this model, we hope to empower existing expertise and enable growth in capacity building for new expertise, build partnerships and collaborations, and open more space for discovery of connections and shared functions across disciplines and projects, learn and grow together as a whole, having knowledge be open, distributed, democratized, and maintained, and of course, break functional silos that currently exist. With that aim, and again, not comprehensive, this is what collaboration, cross-function, hyper-communication and coordination looks like for us, we hope. Working together across all of our communities, accelerating change and building knowledge together with internal and external efforts flowing into each other. Next. The ultimate goal is to create an open global landscape following fair and care data principles, enhanced via connections to other sources of information and with continuous evolution alongside best practices and standards. And to power this through alignment across our overlapping communities. For, for NMNH and our new informatics center, one of our key pushes will be to work on our own uh, part of that through a collaborative knowledge layer that addresses this goal. Our efforts to strengthen our communities is critical to that because we must be able to open our data up to con contribution by more people, a wider range of expertise, and leverage data sources and authority that both exist in various pockets of our museum, but also in all of those initiatives that fit into the global biodiversity landscape we've mentioned before. Next. So with that, we just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone involved in this process from the visiting committee members to the NMNH task force and executive team and to the people who took the time to participate in our external review. Thank you. We're very interested in continuing this conversation, hence the session, um, and learning more from all of you and figuring out some of these solutions together. So please feel free to contact us and reach out and let's talk about it.
So I think we can go ahead and transition to Ian. All right. We have a couple minutes, so there's no hurry, but. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> Just you give me the go ahead when we're ready to go. I'm just not sure if it matters if we are on this blocks of time because you were set to start at the 15 after. <laughs> mm. We're not parallel, so it's not as critical, but also if people are scheduling around joining at a certain time. Sure. Are there any questions maybe coming in on Vuvo? We just got a question in, but it's a little bit of a lengthy one. <laughs> yeah, so um, Deb asked in the chat if we have formal plans to gather more information or a form. Rebecca, I can take a stab if you want, or if you wanna. You can go ahead if you have something on your mind. Okay. We'll talk about it more, but we do want to continue to do more information gathering and we'll be doing more one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with other organizations. Um, and we do want to try to share a lot of what we're learning as well uh, and get good documentation together. So it's a not much of a detailed answer, but a start. Okay, Ian, you're good to go. All right, uh, thanks everybody. So I'm going to be talking about the Natural Science Collections Facility this evening, uh, the NSCF, and um, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of the hub team or the coordinating team, uh, which I will um, introduce a little bit later. Uh, one moment, I just want to get my mouse pointer here. Um, so the NSCF is an initiative that's funded by the National Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa. Uh, it's a network of 17 institutions, uh, collections institutions, so uh, museums and herbaria. Um, these institutions have traditionally operated very independently, and uh, what we need to do now is bring them together into a single integrated uh, unit that operates according to the same standards. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting about this is that the National Department sees these collections housed by these institutions as important research infrastructure for the country. And that's a very important development um, for these institutions and their uh, long-term sustainability. So um, our, uh, our vision for the NSCF is a dynamic network that values and recognizes the African context to promote, upgrade, and make accessible natural science collections and data for research and services to enable sustainable enriched life on earth. And the informatics component is central to this uh, with digitization and data publication being one of our key goals. And we use this metaphor of an African village to kind of conceptualize what we're trying to do. So um, this little village has got all these individual sort of family units or homesteads with little uh, huts uh, where the people dwell in their sort of little um, grain silos. So each of these is kind of like an analogy for an individual institution. Um, but they're all part of a bigger village. So they're there to support each other, to help each other. Um, but there are people as well. So there can be, there's room for conflict and disagreement. Um, but at the end of the day, it's um, an integrated unit overall. And that's what's new for the NSCF in South Africa. Uh, this is our coordinating hub. I'm not going to uh, talk about everybody here, but we've got um, we've got people working in collections, we've got people doing uh, data capture, um, but Michelle Hamer is um, the project lead and the NSCF was her brainchild and um, she's the one who got it all off the ground. Now we do things a little bit differently and that's thanks to these two ladies, uh, Desiree Paulson on the left and Ilza Alkers on the right. They are our organizational development consultants or transformation consultants. Uh, they joined uh, the project uh, relatively early on, and they've been facilitating, um, facilitating a lot of what we've been doing in terms of uh, community building. So um, there will be a link posted in the uh, chat on Hoover, um, where you guys can see a presentation that these two ladies um, have given, 
um, talking about our particular change management uh, theory, our, our theory of change that we follow uh, in the NSCF. So, like I say, we do things a little bit differently and uh, community is uh, central to everything that we do. So we had our um, biannual forum earlier this year, uh, virtually, of course, um, everyone's videos on. We started this off with a session talking about uh, uh, personal uh, well-being in the time of uh, COVID-19. Uh, with, uh, with, we had a meditation session. And if you told me three years ago that you would, go, that you would have um, staff members from museums and herbaria in South Africa all doing meditation together, I would, have, I would not have believed you. And what people are doing here is they're putting their hands up against the sides of their of Zoom screens to connect virtually because we're not able to connect in person. We do things like uh, draw pictures. We don't sit around tables and have regular meetings. Um, if there are things that need to be hashed out and discussed, you get a set of cokey pens or um, wax crayons and off you go and you start drawing things out. It's one of the things that we do. We make extensive use of the Liberating Structures tools. This is a website that you can visit. Um, again, the link uh, will be in the chat and um, uh, really good tools for sort of unpacking things and getting people working together. One of the things that I want to uh, focus on in this talk is this uh, particular method that we use called active listening. And what happens here is, uh, so we do this at the beginning of workshops, or we sometimes just do it as like a, a nice team building exercise or connecting exercise. And what happens is the group breaks up into uh, pairs and um, each, uh, each pair sits uh, uh, with their knees facing each other. The facilit facilitators put a slide up um, on a screen somewhere with a set of prompt questions, uh, which, are, which, which are there to guide the discussion. And for five minutes, one of the persons in the pair speaks. They speak to those questions, those prompt questions, and the other person just has to sit and listen. Um, the idea is that you have to listen with your head, with your heart, and with your feet. So you're listening to what the person is saying. You're listening to what feelings are coming across. And the feet of, is the sort of grounded aspect of it, in your, and that's where you're listening to their intention. At the end of their five minutes, um, then the listener has to repeat back to the speaker what they said. Um, uninterpreted, un, uh, um, they don't, they don't uh, talk about their own experiences. They don't talk about you know, what they thought the person uh, might be trying to get at or trying to fix anything they were saying. It's literally just repeating back what they said. So you really have to listen uh, during this exercise. And after you've done that round, then, um, then the two people swap the roles, swap and you repeat. And um, it's really interesting to see from this just how many people have said that they realized how much work they have to put into listening because um, it's actually quite hard work. Um, one of the activities that we did, uh, this was in one of our in-person uh, in forums uh, earlier on before COVID-19, uh, we tried to tackle some of the issues around data sharing. Um, and so what the facilitators did was get, give us these uh, questions. Uh, we used a method called, called cafe conversations where a group of people sit around a table and discuss one of these particular questions for about five or 10 minutes, making all kinds of notes on a big um, sort of um, flip chart sized uh, piece of paper. And if you look at these questions, I mean, they, they require quite a lot of in, uh, introspection. So how have our particular lives and histories shaped our ideas and practices around issues of shared access to data? Um, or how do we work with the tension between ownership and stewardship of data? So, so this is interesting, uh, uh, introducing the idea that there is a difference between ownership and stewardship. And I think um, a lot of the people that we work with in collections have a very strong sense of ownership of their data, um, of their data sets. Um, and then this is just a brief summary of some of the points that came out there. So um, people, people are concerned about things like sensitive data um, and embargoing data. So things like originators rights, data quality, and I said, I, I sort of group these as things that are under, con that we've got under control. We know how to deal with them. Um, we, I mean, it's not easy, but we know how. Um, but what's not under control is things like these very varied attitudes to data sharing. The interesting thing is we got very little feedback on this um, question here, this sort of very introspective question. Um, and issues like racial exclusion come up. If you know anything about South African history, that's an important uh, factor that we're um, hoping to deal with. Um, Another, uh, something else we've been doing extensively in the NSCF is training. And, um, and I think this is an important part of the community building 
process. So offering extensive training in the use of Specify. We've standardized on Specify for museum collections. We do use a different, uh, we use Brahms for, uh, for herbarium collections. Um, and so everyone's busy migrating across to Specify. And so there's been quite a lot of training for that. Uh, we ran a um, sort of a, a foundational um, technical skills course uh, earlier this year. It was a six month course where people got their hands dirty with working with um, working directly with data in databases and then learning the basics of how to write scripts in Python and pull data out of a database in Python and do some manipulation and stick it back in the database again. And um, what I'm hoping to do, uh, so, so this course was really good in terms of community building, I think, because it was tough and uh, the participants um, uh, really sort of like, it, it was a good opportunity for them to kind of pull together and help each other out uh, throughout the course. And then I'm hoping to run something like a biodiversity informatics 101 course um, next year, perhaps, uh, which is just gonna be a very basic kind of introduction to the landscape um, of uh, things that are going on in this field. So um, how are we doing in terms of uh, the African village? Um, in some respects, we're doing okay. Um, some people really have really bought into the process. Some people are still a little bit reluctant. Um, but on the other hand, um, I, think we, I think some people might be feeling somewhat alienated. So, so this is not an easy process. It takes a very long time to, um, to affect this kind of transformation. And um, that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I would, uh, if you'd like to follow what the NSCF is doing, we do have a social media presence. Um, again, the links will be uh, in the chat and that's it from me, thank you. Thanks, Ian, that was great. We do have time for um, some questions. We do have one that's already popped up. Um, the question is from Erica. Was hiring external experts to help with organizational development a decision you made prior to launching this project or was it a reaction to how things were going once it started? Um, it was a decision made before we launched. Um, I, think, I think it's something that is essential if you're gonna do something like, uh, so especially in the South African context where we've got um, significant issues like race related stuff. Um, and that's what, you know, that's the kind of stuff that these guys are kind of specifically qualified to, um, to help deal with. Um, but yeah, they were there essentially from the beginning. And the next question is, is uh, from Yuda. How do you introduce the liberating structure exercises or meditations into a scientific community that was not used, is not used to such approaches? Was that... <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's not easy. So so these um, so these consultants. So we so we would have these uh, um, quite extensive workshops. Our first workshop was five days, and um, and and entirely facilitated by these two ladies. And it was just you know using all these different kinds of techniques. Sort of starting off with breaking the ice right at the beginning with doing some active listening exercises. Um, they introduced something called check-ins as well, which is. Um, you know, so, so we don't have any meetings with desks in front of us. So people, people like it just would never happen that someone's got a desk with a laptop that they're busy on while they're at a meeting. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we sit in, we sit in a circle and everybody checks in, we do what we're doing in the meeting and everyone checks out at the end. So it was kind of like a gradual introduction, um, of these different, uh, different methods and approaches. Um, yeah. It did not happen overnight. Um, and we have a question from Yorit. Um, what is your um, ideal ratio in time between soft or social aspects of data integration versus hard technical data integration tasks? And how does this ratio change over the years? Sure. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to kind of break it down to a ratio. But um, I, think, I think you have to put in the amount of time that's needed. So, that, so that, admittedly, I think that's one of the things that we've underestimated is the amount of time and effort that actually needs to go into this, um, uh, this community building stuff. And um, so, I mean, we, we probably have a, a workshop about, you know, maybe like a two or three day workshop, maybe four or five times a year. 
and um, and then we have other sort of shorter um, engagements as well. Once a month, we have a two-hour meeting with um, what we call a coordinating committee. Um, so that sort of gives some sense of how much effort is going into this. Thanks. Um, I think that was the last question we have. So we can, um, next we have a pre-recorded talk from Marie. I would uh, just note again, Marie is present and on hand to answer any questions um, should you have them, but we will be watching a pre-recorded talk first. Um, we do have a couple minutes before, or we can move ahead. I don't know. I'll go ahead and get it set up and uh, get it playing, and then Marie will have some more time for questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Hello everyone, my name is Marie Bourgeon and I am a data administrator at the GBF Secretariat. Today I will introduce you to our registry of scientific collections, also called GeoCycle. GeoCycle is a community created clearinghouse of collection information across several scientific disciplines, not just natural history. It includes data about physical collections, such as what they contain, where they are located, who can tell you more about these collections and how to get in touch with them, as well as their institutions and associated staff members. GeoCycle was originally developed by the Consortium of the Barcode of Life and lived at the Smithsonian Institution until GBIF inherited it in 2018. You can find more information on this news item. In 2020, our developers designed and set up a system to link specimen-related occurrences published on GBIF to GeoCycle entries whenever possible. This means that institutions can aggregate metrics for their digitized specimens, regardless of how they were published on GBIF. One data set can correspond to several collections, and several data sets can contribute to the same collection. Today, more than 100 million specimen-related occurrences have been linked to geocycle entries. So here is how the occurrence linking works. Every geocycle entry is associated with an institution or collection code and an institution or collection identifier. Most occurrences published on GBIF have a collection and an institution code, and sometimes a collection and institution identifier as well. When the new occurrence is published, our interpretation pipeline uses our GeoCycle lookup service to check its institution and collection codes and identifiers. And it tries to find a match in GeoCycle. Whenever there is more than one candidate, our system uses the country to choose a match. If the system isn't able to find a match, or if the match found is solely based on codes, the specimen-related occurrence is flagged by the system. Please check our blog post on the topic if you would like to know more. As I just mentioned, linking occurrences to GeoCycle entries is made possible by our GeoCycle lookup service. This service is described in our registry API documentation, and anyone can use it to check institution and collection codes and identifiers in GeoCycle. But the lookup service isn't the only GeoCycle API function available to the community. The GeoCycle API, called Collections API in our documentation, provides a number of functions to search, access, and edit the GeoCycle information. You can also export the result of your search as a tab separated table. In fact, the API allows you to do the same things you can do with the web UI and more. You can find more information in our documentation. 
Anyone can use GeoCycle to search for collections based on their attributes, such as country, content type, or preservation type, as well as their codes and identifiers. You can then find more information about those collections and their institutions, and a way to get in touch with the people who work there. Institutions can use GeoCycle to be more visible and discoverable. It is a way for them to showcase their collections, including undigitized ones. We hope GeoCycle can open up opportunities for collaboration and support. National organizations such as GBIF nodes can use GeoCycle to get an overview of the institutions and collections available in their countries. This information combined with the digitized data made available on GBIF can help guide some of the data mobilization effort by the community. As I mentioned before, each GeoCycle entry is associated with a code and identifier. Although the institution and collection codes aren't always unique in GeoCycle, GeoCycle is the closest thing we have to a reference database for those codes and identifiers. By making them available via our lookup service, we hope to improve database interoperability and enable links with other systems. We updated the GeoCycle permission model to facilitate community creation. There are two ways that people can contribute to GeoCycle. They can either make change suggestions via our suggested change button and interface. This doesn't require any login and anyone can do it. You just need to fill the form presented and submit it with a comment about yourself and your email address. You can suggest to update the content of a page or create a new entry or merge duplicates or turn an institution into a collection. The suggestion will then be forwarded to the relevant people for review. The other way to contribute to GeoCycle is to become an editor or mediator. Editors and mediators can directly make changes to GeoCycle and can also review and apply suggestions concerning the entries included in their permission scope. Both of them can edit entries, but only mediators can merge and delete entries. Both mediators and editors can be given permission to work at the collection, institution, or national level. In practice, Institutions have to become editors to maintain their institution and collection entries, while some GBIF node managers became mediators to maintain, review, and apply the suggestions for the institutions and collections in their countries. We know that maintaining information across several data repositories can be challenging for institutions. This is why we would like to synchronize GeoCycle with as many reliable sources as possible. We worked with Indexer by Rome to set up weekly synchronization with our system. So Herbaya can maintain their entries directly in the Indexer by Rome, and the changes will be visible in GeoCycle automatically. We want to continue exploring synchronizations with other sources. Currently, we are working on enabling synchronization with dataset metadata published on GBIF. The idea is that if a dataset corresponds to a collection, we'll be able to choose it as a source of information and only maintain the information in your IPT or wherever you maintain the data published on GBIF. In addition to that, we worked with IDBio to import their collection information in GeoCycle. The data are now maintained in the GBIF registry and displayed on the IDIGBIO portal via the collections API. The IDIGBIO data managers are now part of our team of editors and mediators and contribute a lot to maintaining the information for the US. We are now reaching out to the community to increase our pool of editors and mediators. This year, we have been involving several GBIF node managers in the creation of GeoCycle. We are also planning to involve applicants for the GBIF managed funding programs, such as BID, the Biodiversity Information for Development, and BIFA, the Biodiversity Information Fund for Asia. We work with external collaborators, such as 
the Biodiversity Crisis Response Committee from Spinach to reach outside of the GBIF community. There are many ways you can help us improve GR cycle. Anyone can check their institution and collection entries and suggest updates or additions via the suggest buttons in the GR cycle interface. If you publish specimen occurrences on GBIF, please link them to GR cycle entries if possible. You can become a registry editor on behalf of your institution or collection. If you work with the National Registry and are interested in sharing the data on GeoCycle, please contact us on the email address below. Tell us how you would like to use the registry in GeoCycle. You can contact us by email or via our GitHub repository. You can become a volunteer translator to make GeoCycle forms accessible in more languages. And finally, you can follow our roadmap and log your feedback and ideas in the GBIF feedback system or directly in our GitHub repository. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. I hope you enjoyed it, and I am happy to answer any questions. Have a nice day. Great, thank you. Um... Rebecca, do you want to read the question? Yeah, I was following up with your to see if there was more to it. So it looks like it cut him off mid question. Um, but I can ask the other question in the meantime. Um, this one's from David Shorthouse. Um, could GR cycle leverage Wikidata as an aggregator of identifiers and collection institution codes? Um, and then they give a link. Um, are there any impediments to that? Um, like the need to maintain historical data. Um, yeah, uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for your question, David. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know how to answer. All I can say is that um, you, what, what you mean to say is that getting the information from Wikidata and, and um, making it available on GeoCycle, right? Yes, okay. Um, so far, what we've been doing uh, relating to Wikidata is to associate it, or at least some, some um, editors, uh, I'm thinking about uh, people from GBIF Norway, they've been uh, associating Wikidata identifiers with GR cycle entries uh, on GR cycle, so people can access information to the related Wikidata entry that way i don't know if we would want to um to to uh, automatically import information from wikidata at that point i don't know um what what technically would be feasible but um the type of identifiers um are supported to to at least link gr cycle to wikidata um if not the other way around so I hope that answers the question. Okay. So we do have um, a question from our more of a comment from Yorit, but it's kind of predicated on seeing the URLs that he's referring to. So you might, after your talk, take a look at the question and Hoova and um, provide your input on that. Yes, I uh, I think that 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 I, I will just check it out after, um, unless there's a a, a a a very important follow up question on it. But uh, I I will take a look. Do we have any other questions? From Marie? Um, Elspeth put one in the chat on oh. Zoom. She's having trouble with oh. I see it. I see it. Thanks, Deb. Um, how does GR Cycle manage the complex hierarchical institution structures? And, you know, coming from the Smithsonian, I'm going to say, hi, how does that work? <laughs> well, the, the short answer is it doesn't manage complex hierarchical structures. So, um, so, 
we don't have a hierarchical model except for the fact that collections belong to an institution and um, the level of information you want to put available to make available on GeoCycle is up to each institution. So that's often one reason why some people are are afraid to suggest updates to GeoCycle because they don't know how their institutions want to be represented, which is not always easy. And is the herbaria its own institution or is it part of a university? And so um, there is no <laughs> there is no hierarchy and there's no ideal model. I know that some editors they've been um, like um, using raw identifiers for their institutions and then putting that attaching it to um, their GR cycle entries as identifiers so that they can say, look, this is the mother institution or something like that. Uh, you can check that out. So um, I guess for now, I'd say external systems are perhaps more able to manage hierarchical structures, but not GR cycle. But you can link to external systems, so it's not too bad. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Talia, if you want to start booting up your slides, I'm going to anecdotally respond to that as well. Um, just to keep the connections between all our talks, uh, that's actually what we're talking about at our museum as part of this new informatics effort. We're going to have a working group to look at how all our collections are can be consistently listed in GR Cycle. So we'll be doing that soon. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of history in our GR cycle codes. So yes, um, but actually you can um, on GR cycle you can um, have multiple identifiers, but now you can also have a main code and alternative codes as well to list all your historical codes. So um, it might not be a proper historical representation of everything, but at least there is one entry where people can see, oh yeah, okay, that, that code also is referring to the Smithsonian. So <laughs> hopefully that helps. Thanks. And uh, there are a couple other questions in the Q&A, if you don't mind taking a look at this, but we can also catch them at the end. Um, but up next we have Talia. All right. Um, thanks, Holly and Rebecca, for putting this session together. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our Paleo Data Working Group. So the Paleo Data Working Group was launched in May of 2020 as a driving force for broader conversations about implementing data standards in paleontology collections. And it arose from a decade or so of increasing coordination between paleo professionals in the United States who were working on digitizing their collections. Community of practice is a term that formalizes activities and objectives that many of us have been doing intuitively. And thinking about our working group as a community of practice can help us intentionally refine how successful it is. Central to a community of practice is the idea that, quote, knowledge is a critical asset that needs to be managed strategically, unquote. And social structures provide more success than information systems alone in this knowledge management. And the bubbles here on the right-hand side of the slide are sort of textbook examples of community of practice practices that the Paleo Data Working Group has been following. So any community relies primarily on individual people. And we recognized really early on that the diversity of individuals in our working group was a strength. We're largely US-based, although with some international participation from members uh, from South Africa and Finland, and the institutions our members come from vary from independent museums to university collections to representatives from uh, federal collections as well. And while many of our community members have long professional relationships, just as many of them are newer to the group are also early career professionals. So our domain is not circumscribed by any particular research agenda, but rather by the need for better data management practices to facilitate research utilizing paleo collections. And we include perspectives from different disciplines of paleontology, including vertebrates, invertebrates, and paleobotany, 
as well as different professional roles, such as collection managers, registrars, digitization coordinators, data managers, information science specialists, and on occasion, curators. Um, we frame problems in a way that make them applicable to all paleo collections versus being specific to a single institution or collection subtype. And because of the diversity of expertise in our group, we can often come up with innovative solutions to challenges that we all face, and then in turn apply successes that others have had to our own collections. Connectivity is essential for sustaining any community of practice and consistency as well as flexibility are important features. We have two primary channels for communication in this group. Um, we have the biweekly virtual happy hour sessions where we gather for live conversations on a predetermined topic. And we also have a Slack work workspace for asynchronous conversations. The happy hours drive collective attention while our Slack workspace is, serves more of a logistical necessity for maintaining the momentum between the happy hour sessions and helps us to stay active as a group. And this workspace also allows us to be inclusive of members whose schedules um, don't allow them to join the live meetings because of either they have other commitments or they might be in a time zone that's challenging to join us. And all of our group documents, including meeting notes, recordings, shared resources, documentations, et cetera, are organized in a shared Google folder or Google Drive folder. And that's made additionally discoverable versus, uh, or excuse me, via the IDIG bio website on the wiki there. So this is just a sampling of topics that we've discussed since we began meeting in 2020. And though some are more specific to paleontology, many relate to general collections data management practices. And we regularly invite speakers from other initiatives to discuss their platforms and how we might work together to improve or extend paleo data. Additionally, every few months, we have an open discussion where group participants can bring up any topic or question they may have. And this has often led to us developing more focused discussions on those topics for future meetings. And it also helps us to stay responsive to the group's needs. So if somebody says, hey, I'm really having a problem with this, we just set up a happy hour and we'll discuss it. Many of us, can't connect with our direct colleagues on professional task issues because of our unique roles within our institutions. So we might be the only collection manager for paleontology at our institution. So this group provides opportunities for ongoing education and professional development, which is really critical. And regardless of a particular member's domain expertise, everyone is leveling up in some way and we all share our expertise while learning from everyone else. We've found that assigning ourselves what we call homework. Um, so for example, taking and scare, sharing screenshots of how our local databases manage a particular piece of information helps everyone to come to the conversation having already given the topic a little bit of thought without a large time commitment um, outside of the actual happy hour session. And this is one of our favorite group activities. And additionally, we've found that dividing and conquering is a really good strategy for situations where we want to get a paleo perspective to be included in some emerging work. So for example, Roger Burkhalter has been um, involved in the material sample task group and Lindsay Walker has been liaising with the collections description task group. Staying up to date is good, but even better is when we can implement change based on the knowledge we gain by our discussions. And here are some examples from our Bionomia happy hour that we had with David Shorthouse in February of this year. And we described um, at the very, at the most basic level, everyone in that happy hour learned something about identifiers and almost everyone ended up with an ORCID ID by the end of the session. At a more advanced level, some members added fields to their agents table and their databases and have started collecting and recording people identifiers. Um, and some of our members have started exploring Bionomia and Wikidata for more information about um, people associated with their collections. While the example on the previous slide showed how our community of practice led to local and institutional level changes, our happy hour conversations have also led to action at a broader scale and such as providing feedback and comments during the most recent Darwin Core review. And 
Here, our group happy hour and Slack discussions really helped us to draft comments that were then submitted to the relevant Darwin Core term issue threads on GitHub as part of that um, revision. And maybe most importantly here, we have found that using our collective voice has helped individuals in our community to feel more comfortable contributing their feedback to some of these broader scale initiatives. So they maybe wouldn't have gone on their own and submitted a comment, but they're really um, happy to provide feedback in this sort of group context. A strong community of practice can also contribute to overlapping community initiatives, such as the example shown here. We often try to include members of our own institutions who might be interested in a particular week's topic, such as georeferencing or digital asset rights. And many of our community members have relevant working groups within their own institutions where they can share and continue conversations that were started in the happy hour sessions. Members are also participating in the standards community through Tadwig task and interest groups, such as the Tadwig ESP interest group, among others. So how do we succeed as a community of practice? Well, we aim to keep the sessions informal, so it's okay to be an occasional kind of drop-in user if that's your comfort level and your time commitment, or you can be a more regular level and participate actively every week. Um, we keep a consistency or a consistent and predictable schedule for how we interact with the bi-weekly happy hours um, on Zoom and then asynchronous chat on Slack. And we make the discussion topics directly applicable using things like the screenshot sharing homework I mentioned earlier, and these often lead to actionable tasks within our own institutional data afterwards. So we see ourselves not just as a community of technical support, but also social and morale building, especially during the height of COVID isolation and lockdowns. Additionally, change is inevitable and our community has and will continue to evolve as people move on and new people join in. And we strive to be inclusive and welcoming and to leave no collections behind. Large, small, near, far, well, poorly funded, whatever. Spread the word. If you want to join us, um, please do. And I think uh, Lindsay Walker is posting some links in the Whova chat. And I think we were going to start a discussion here on Whova for paleo data. So if you'd like to chat more or join us, um, please do so. And then lastly, what's next? Um, while we would like to work on broadening our community of practice by reaching out to other paleo data creators and managers, um, we haven't reached out a lot to the research community. We've started those conversations, but I think we'd like to do that more. And we also want to continue to actively participate in the design of emerging standards and documentation with the, bio, the broader bioinformatics community. And with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, none of this would be possible without all the people who contribute every week and all of our invited guest speakers and our wonderful community of people. And we also have another talk I'm gonna plug tomorrow um, in session CO02 um, on improving the adoption and evolution of data standards. So stay tuned. And with that, I will stop. Thanks, Talia. I'm a bit biased, but that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for participating. Talia's one of the best logos in the business. So we have to give a big shout out to Molly Phillips from IDIG Bio for uh, making our, our little trilicorn logo. <laughs> we don't have any questions in the QA yet. I'm sure it's matter. We're getting little hand clappy emojis though. So good job. <laughs> and that was uh, to create a section in the community forum part, right? For I discussing paleo data this week? I believe so. I don't actually have Whova open, so I'm not sure what Lindsay, Lindsay said. Yes. Lindsay says yes. Okay. <laughs> and if you're interested in paleo data, there's a tag for paleo data you can add to your Whova profile too. If you feel so inclined, so we can find you. I will also use this as an opportunity to plug the working sessions for the Tadwig virtual conference this year will be Wednesdays and Thursdays in November. And we will carry some of this discussion about paleo data forward during the Earth Sciences and Paleobiology interest group. 
AKA the ESP working group, which has the best <laughs> name ever. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Deb put it in the Zoom chat, Deb put in a link to that session. Lots of chat. Okay. I don't see any questions coming in, so. Okay, great. It's a thorough presentation, thank you. Um, thanks, Talia. And up next, we have a pre-recorded presentation from Vince. Um, again, like before, Vince is present and able to answer questions afterwards. Um, but first, we will watch the video. Hello, everybody. My name is Vince Smith. And with a team of colleagues as part of some work we've been doing for DISCO, the Distributed System of Scientific Collections, We've been trying to develop a method to visualize and align the activities of major biodiversity informatics initiatives. And this is something that a number of people have tried to do over the years, and it's quite a challenging um, thing to do. People have approached this by looking at things like project interactions, looking at co-authorship patterns, or maybe trying to kind of crudely classify um, uh, various um, initiatives and the infrastructures that have been working in this space. But these visualizations are often very hard to interpret, and um, they uh, uh, you certainly can use them in a practical sense when it comes to kind of planning things like major investments. And it's quite important because we live in an enormously crowded set of space when it comes to the various projects and initiatives that are happening globally. There are more than 600 initiatives listed on the old TADWIG website. It's an extraordinary dynamic list. It's constantly changing. It operates at different scales from local to national to global. And if you're a funder trying to make decisions about where to invest or why to invest, or even if you're an infrastructure provider and trying to decide what areas you should be moving into and maybe what areas you should be leaving, then some form of tool to help you make those decisions would be extremely useful. And um, uh, this working group that was set up um, within DISCO to look at this was had this aim, the ultimate aim of building a simplified visualization. So something that was really intuitive that would show the niche of each infrastructure. And we were inspired by this visualization that was published in a recent paper, which looked at the various different data types and also the different phases of life cycle with data and tried to map onto that the actions of various um, uh, infrastructure organizations. So iNaturalist, Catalog of Life, GBIF, et cetera, within this, um, uh, this um, uh, complex space. So within this team, the first thing we did was really try to figure out well, what were the dimensions that we wanted to measure. And one important characteristic that came from the outset was we wanted to know not just what people are doing now, but where people want to be in terms of the development of their infrastructure. So what are their long-term strategic ambitions? We also wanted to look at the different categories of activity that broadly encompass this space, so things like data, standards, software, hardware, and policy. There's obviously many different types of data that we handle, and broadly we've listed those there, so things like specimens, taxonomies, trait data. There are different phases of activity, so things we do with that data, so the creation of data, aggregation, access, etc. And also we needed to measure the relative technological maturity of activities in this space. And that ranges from essentially no activity at all, right the way up to what we call performance and predominance, where people are very busy and active in those areas. So we end up with this quite complex multi-dimensional space to try and visualize. What we did is we put together some standardized definitions for these terms, wrote a frequently asked questions document, and then circulated that to 10 major infrastructures I won't go in now as to why those 10, but it was 10 large ones that were mindful of their proximity in terms of activities to what's going on in DISCO. Uh, and we circulated this sheet alongside the instructions and asked representatives from each of those infrastructures to then score themselves. 
And we ended up with this really amazing data set, some 6,300 data points for those 10 infrastructures, um, giving a picture not only of what they're doing now, but where they plan to be in the future. Now, the next challenge is, well, what do you do with this information? How do you visualize it? And I have to say, we struggled um, to begin with coming up with some visualizations like this, which are really a very long way from anything I think would be clear and intuitive, which was our ultimate aim. But these dashboards that we built were useful in terms of hoping out, helping us to narrow down on determining what questions we wanted to ask of the data. And um, they allowed us to uh, essentially reduce some of the complexity of the data by looking at some of the patterns that were there. And I'm going to run through now some of the um, uh, outputs, some of the learnings, if you like, from um, this data set that we've discovered. So one um, fairly straightforward topic to look at is given the breadth of activity for each of these infrastructures, um, are, are they generalists or are they specialists? Some, like say iNaturalist or Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, they have a very tight focus on a particular activity, a particular data type, for example. Others are really quite broad. So LifeWatch, GBIF, um, for example, um, they have a broad spread of activities and they also plan to maintain that broad spread as well. We could also look at what kinds of data are probably being most intensively worked on both now and again in the future. And that's what's shown in that um, those little word clouds there. So the bigger words, specimens, formal observations, those are the kind of areas that are most worked on at the moment. And then looking towards the ambitions, how those infrastructures are changing. Interestingly, traits, so the phenotypic traits of um, uh, organisms are uh, going to be a much more predominant in the future, at least according to the stated ambitions of those infrastructures. We could also look at things like holes or gaps in the landscape um, and two really stood out so one it was um, the development of new hardware although there was some ambiguity in how people were interpreting hardware which actually means we need to be a bit cautious in terms of that interpretation but standards was a really big gap but interestingly most infrastructures had plans to fill those gaps through their activities with respect to the need for new standards so that was quite reassuring in some ways. And then we can start to look at contacts. So if you break down, <coughs> excuse me, the precise combination of what an infrastructure is doing um, uh, across those different phases and categories of activity, you can count up how those are shared with other infrastructures. And you can see in this sorted list on the left. So, this is just for um, activities that we call predominant, and it also excludes hardware because we were a bit nervous about the way that people have defined hardware. Um, but you can see that um, uh, some infrastructures have got uh, a lot of uniqueness, some um, perhaps a bit less so, um, and we can also see where precisely they're operating under those data, software, standards and policy areas. Uh, where uh, each of those infrastructures are working now and again into the future. And then our overall aim was some really straightforward visualization that would um, uh, explain what these infrastructures are doing. And that's what we're trying, I think, what we're getting to um, here. So let me just run through this. So this, um, uh, each of these concentric circles represents uh, a different infrastructure. They show the number of different areas of activity that are unique to each infrastructure, where they contact, with whom they contact, um, and also um, how ambitions will change that pattern. So for example, if we take Geocase, which is a geo earth science infrastructure, they have five unique areas of activity, three contact LifeWatch, two contact GBIF, 15 um, areas are what they're planning to expand into over time. Six of those would contact LifeWatch, so two of those GBIF. So that might, for example, pose some questions about should GeoCase enter those spaces um, uh, and how are they different? Now, there are a few failures in the methodology. 
So some standardized definitions probably need to be a bit tighter, particularly those about hardware. Um, there was a degree of over or underestimating the maturity by some of the scorers, and we try to mitigate that by having multiple scorers, but that's a hard thing to do. The visualization um, might not scale to hundreds of infrastructures, and that's something we're currently exploring. It should be bearable in mind, not all contact or overlap with an infrastructure is necessarily bad. <coughs> um, it's a signal really to investigate further. And in some areas, competition is good, particularly where there's lower levels of maturity. And a statistical approach might be useful in terms of some of the visualizations going forward. So what are we doing in terms of next steps? We're well, refining the visualization. We are publishing this. We've got the first publication almost ready to go now. There's a potential to develop an online self-assessment tool where one could just drop your scores for your infrastructure in and instantly see how you relate to uh, other infrastructures. And I think that would be a really interesting development. And then lastly, a number of organizations have said they wanted to add data. And a few quick acknowledgements lastly, um, obviously all our data providers, it was quite an effort for them to provide that data. Uh, big thanks to Disco for supporting this work and my co-authors. And lastly, uh, but by no means least, Sarah Vinson at the Natural History Museum in London, a data analyst who's helped with some of those visualizations. So thank you very much. Thanks, Vince. That was great. I really liked that first visualization, even if it maybe isn't the easiest one to interpret, but it looks really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a real challenge to come up with something really simple and intuitive. And I'm not sure we're 100% there yet, but we're getting there, I would say. And apologies, Steve, for stealing your Sauron reference as well. I didn't expect to join Tadwig today and have a Lord of the Rings side theme, but I like it. <laughs> I don't think we have any active questions in the chat. Uh, not yet. But we do have one lingering one directed to one of our speakers if we want to get to that before the panel. And then by then, maybe some for specific events. Ah. Here's one. Um, Deb uh, wants to know how have the different data providers reacted to the results or have they not seen them yet? So that's a great question. So they've seen some of them, um, uh, but not necessarily all of them. I think most of them have, have, have reacted uh, fondly and well, and, and there's not really been any problem there. Uh, I think there could be some issues, particularly some requests to kind of rescore certain things. But I think this is what would really mean, you know, if we could make this a dynamic tool, for example, so that people could self score and drop their scores in, then that would address some of that. I think the other problem is there is a risk around, if you like, the, the, the precision with which scorers score themselves that self-assessment process is quite hard and, and adding some quality control there is quite important. So with some data providers, there was quite a two-way conversation with me uh, or others trying to kind of um, uh, moderate people's ambitions in some cases or scores of themselves. And in other cases actually saying, look, I think you're doing yourself a disservice because it's very clear you're working in this space. Um, and actually, I think you're you're missing a trick by not saying that. So it works both ways. You're two years in, I would be better at my meetings game. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question for Vince? play the Jeopardy song in her head. I think we can go to the next one. And of course, I'll take this. Uh, we have one more talk. Um, 
reminder to everyone, we do have the panel discussion at the end. So feel free to drop more questions for any of the speakers from the session or just general things that you might want to hear um, responses from anyone that's willing to take the question on. <laughs> um, thanks, Vince. So next up, we have our last talk uh, before that panel discussion uh, from UDEF. So can you see my um, slides all right and hear me? Yes. Good. OK, hello. I'm Jutta Buschbaum, and I'm presenting for a group of authors uh, who found each other during the recent consultation by the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge. Uh, We can't advance. Oh, okay. So at the intersection of biodiversity and collections based research, infrastructure development, and conservation action, we as scientists, collection managers, and consultants are called to contribute our expertise, knowledge, and experience to achieving the vision put forward by the Convention on Biological Diversity of living in harmony with nature. Today, we are not only at a critical point in time for stopping and turning around the biodiversity crisis, we are also at an important stage in the negotiations for the CBD's upcoming post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, GBF, and its monitoring, which both are currently under development. It is important to be aware that the currently negotiated GBF will be guiding global biodiversity conservation action for the next 30 years. The post-2020 GBF monitoring framework requires powerful data infrastructures, which are able to integrate data across scales from locally to globally and across sectors. For example, integrating data from environmental, biological, traditional and cultural knowledge, social, economic, and so on sectors. Such infrastructures will need to present highly diverse data in harmonized ways for input to national and global reporting pathways and assessment. Serendipitously concerted efforts are currently underway, led by the Collections and Biodiversity Informatics Community to build an extensible, harmonized global data infrastructure that integrates primary biodiversity records of all kinds and the derived as well as associated data. For more details about these efforts and their outcomes, join Symposium 7 on the Digital Extended Specimen on Wednesday. One line of work and outcome in these efforts is the ethical and legal framework presented here. In all of these endeavors, we need to be aware that powerful, globally extensible infrastructures will enable and promote activities that have a multitude of consequences, requiring ethical, legal, social, economic, conservation, data protection, and so on considerations. Thereby, rights-based approaches will ensure and enable open access to primary biodiversity data information and knowledge, and thus the effective sharing of benefits derived from such data. Such, a process, such approaches lay the foundations for communities of practice. An ethical and legal framework will need to meet the requirements and preferences of impacted communities. Among these communities are importantly indigenous peoples and local communities, businesses, as well as collections, their staff and scientists. 
data infrastructures that take the requirements and preferences of different communities into account can focus and attract community involvement. Community acceptance, in turn, drives the development of the data resources and data use. Therefore, general guidelines for an ethical and legal framework are, it is important that it provides added value to provided in providers and users. That is, it will need to be efficient and effective while being at the same time user-friendly and easy to understand. Furthermore, it needs to provide the functionality for participative decision-making. That is, for flexible, fine-grained input choices and thus control suitable to a wide range of stakeholders and communities. And finally, the framework will need to provide legal clarity and security even under dynamically changing legal, social, and natural systems. Thus, there are very good reasons to developing and implementing versatile, robust, user-friendly, and effective ethical and legal workflows. Taking into account these guidelines for an ethical and legal framework, how should this implementation look like as part of the extensible infrastructure for digital data? In this figure um, depicted are the characteristics and functions that we identified to be of fundamental importance. In the following, I will lead you through the layers of the natively implemented framework. The outermost layer is concerned with the overall sustainability of the data infrastructure, as defined, for example, by the recently published EU regulation for a taxonomy for sustainable activities. Two main and complementing points we would like to highlight. The new infrastructure will consume your resources. Thus, to make sense, it will need to substantially contribute to the conservation and protection of biodiversity. This is complemented by the requirement to do no harm. We need to reduce the social, material, and ecological footprints of the infrastructure implementation. The next layer of the framework concerns the science policy interface. For the data infrastructure to be accepted by policymakers and of impact for scale independent, local and national to global conservation and benefit sharing, it will need to use language that is CBD conformant. In addition, we need to specifically show, that, show the importance of the digital and extensible data infrastructure for the continuing design and implementation of the post-2020 GBF, as well as for mobilization and aggregation of data for its monitoring elements and indicators. Capacity building, user attribution, and functionality that provides transactional provenance records are, are crucial for the acceptance and thus success of the data infrastructure. Therefore, we need to implement a transactional or auditing system that records every transaction, thus provides a record of provenance and thereby the basis for user attribution. A core task is to amplify workforce capacity across all areas of work with digital systems. The infrastructure needs to be of practical value to every stakeholder who interacts with it. These are scientists, collection managers, registrars and staff, locally engaged activists and communities, conservation managers, government officials or policy makers. The digital object architecture lies at the core of the ethical and legal framework, since it provides the functionality required by open science and benefit sharing. The overall goal of the globally extensible data infrastructure is to publish, to openly publish as much data and metadata as possible online and to be closed only in as far as it is necessary. 
for example, for the protection of sensitive data or due to legal reasons. To enable this, it is necessary to establish a powerful and well sought out layer of user and data access management in this way, ensuring the security of sensitive data. The digital object architecture also provides the functionality that allows providers and users to participate in decision making by setting their own rules for access and use in a finely, finely graded way and at a fine scale resolution. The way to implement this is to encrypt data and metadata where necessary. Encryption can be set at the level of an individual record, a digital object, or field. Access is provided via the associated, associated digital cryptographic keys. Similar to the management of access, obligations, rights, and cultural information regarding use should be linked also to the digital keys. In order to develop the specifications for concrete implementations of the framework, the next step is for us to join the upcoming TATWIC task group, which is initiated by Gabi Drüge from Berlin Botanical Garden and Museum for GGBN. If you are interested in ethical and legal questions, consider joining the task group. You can either contact Gabi Drüge, myself, or any of the authors of this presentation. And yeah. We call you to build bridges between biodiversity data of all kinds and to new communities of data providers and users. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's a nice sentiment to end on the building bridges. Very important. We have a question from Abigail. Um, the list of different types of users you provided for the infrastructure was quite extensive. Do you think there's a risk in attempting to be so broadly useful that it ends up not being useful to those users? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think you have to certainly start somewhere. You need to focus um, your development in one area. So. At least this is my approach or my perspective for the infrastructure is um, the post-2020 global biodiversity monitoring framework. And that is just, it is global, it is across sectors, it's transdisciplinary. So in the end, we need to um, provide functionality for a very wide diversity of stakeholders and users. However, what I, hope or what I think, I mean, we don't really have the experience at this point of time with these kind of infrastructures. But what I think is that the basic technical infra, um, functionality or technical aspects and implementations are actually the same um, across stakeholder groups and communities. So once you have the functionality in place, um, it should actually be possible. And if you build it, um, or if you implement it based on, on legal um, regulations and um, yeah, um, licenses, use agreements, um, um, labels for traditional knowledge and um, community um, rules, then I believe it is also possible. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for you to? Giving people time to type, <laughs> potentially. Okay.
don't see any in the various spots. Yeah, no, I'm like chat, chat, Q and A. <laughs> oh wait, there's the other chat. Um, nope. Okay. Um, we have a, a plus one on building bridges in the chat, so. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. It's great. Um, did we want to address any of the remaining questions before moving to the panel? We have just one unanswered question, so we can okay. either have Ian address it now or he can address it um, asynchronously. I also think it's a good panel question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can just transition. Okay. Um, great. So thank you to all the speakers. Uh, those were great talks and I think a wonderful variety of perspectives of how community has a role in the various things that we're all working on at different levels of that larger global biodiversity informatics landscape. Um, and I just want to add before we jump in, um, obviously we have the speakers that presented in the session, but scrolling through the participant list of our session, I noticed names that I recognize involved in a lot of other very major community built community driven efforts. Um, so if you feel that you have something to add or want to chime in, feel free to um, add something to the chat or raise your hand uh, as we move forward. And oh, and um, we're also uh, joined by Deb Paul um, as part of the panel. Um, many of you know her as someone very involved in this topic, and I think she has some related sessions later this week as well. Um, so thanks, Deb, for joining us for the panel. Thanks you for the can't dare talk about community without including Deb. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, is it possible to spotlight all of the speakers? I don't know how that works. Yeah, absolutely. We can do it for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I, just, I don't need to look at the recording of my giant face the whole time. Lovely. We're missing. Okay. Um, I will get started. I'm going to get started with the question that's remaining. Um, with all of these different projects and the community aspects to it and building out capacity, um, what is your sense of the staff adjustment needed to meet these big goals that we're looking at? I think it could be very different depending on which one of you we're talking to. So feel free to jump in wherever you'd like. Maybe I could have a go with that one. I think it depends on where you start um, in that. So often, I often say we kind of work middle out within an organization. You don't want to be at the top. You don't want to be at the bottom where it's really hard to maybe influence the audience that you need. You need to be somewhere in the middle and then work your way out. Um, it is all about community ultimately, because really there's a huge revolution in the way that we think about our collections and what we do. And it's all digital and it's all data. Um, so you kind of have to be there, I would say, in the middle and then work to your senior managers and to you know everyone in an organization really. I'll, I would jump in really quick. I would say um, I was looking to see if David Shorthouse was in the house here, but I don't see him right now. Um, he would jump in, I think, I'm putting words in his mouth. So this notion about data, there's always a lot of focus on the data. We need the data. We need the data to answer questions. We need the data to build tools. We need the data for research. We need, the, and, and, and we have to really stop a minute. And a couple of talks have highlighted this and said, hey, wait a minute. It's the people that are 
gathering this information for their own purposes, uh, whatever those might be. It's organizations that are looking for that data for whatever their purposes might be. And uh, it very much reminded me of two things, one of which I think I can remember right now. <laughs> There's a Grinnell, a Grinnell paper on what they call boundary objects, and it's from the social sciences, and it talks very nicely about this overlap between looking for that place where this particular group or person's needs overlap with this particular organization or group. And so I think that the important point here is that it's important not to only look inward about what do I need for what I want to do, but spend at least a small amount of time thinking about the sort of outward either effects or the outward benefits, the outward opportunities uh, to be synergistic um, with your efforts. Great. Thanks, Vince and Deb. Um, real quick, we're having a little bit of technical challenges with the gallery view. Um, Holly, it's fixed. Um, okay. It's just something we can't have more than four spotlighted or Whova's not going to like it. So. Okay, great. Thanks. So everything's good in Whova. So your question was how we move the community forward, Holly, was that pretty much what you were asking us? Um, I think part of it is how what staff adjustments. Yeah. 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 Staff adjustments are just participation adjustments so that we can converge around these ideas and um, work within these different groups and how they overlap. So I, we have more questions. So. I mean, I'd push that back to, to Ian. I was that was one of my sort of questions to him is what was his his sense okay. of staff adjustment to the whole thing? Like where did the idea come from and, and how is the staff like yay or like oh my god? <laughs> um it's it's both. Um so so yeah, so there's there's very varied kind uh, responses to to what we're doing um, some people are absolutely 100 percent on board they love the stuff that we're doing um, but for a lot of other people they kind of very um, you know they're very work focused you know they don't really feel like they've got time for this uh, soft stuff where we go and sit and talk about our feelings and, and that kind of thing and um and it's quite interesting because the these consultants that we've got, um, you know, they're, they're coming in from a from a very particular angle where they're um, they're trying to sort of break down some of these traditional ways that people work. I think in I think in our field, especially, a lot of people are incredibly work focused. They're literally just work, work, work all the time. Um, you know, twelve hours a day, every day of the week and weekends, kind of thing. And, um, and what they're saying is that, the, you know, this is not a healthy way of working and there are more, um, you know, there are more productive uh, and, and, um, and healthier ways of working if we start moving away from that and start looking at interpersonal relationships um, and things like that. I think, so the one example that they gave was that, um, you know, the, so, so, so often in these organizations, people are kind of walking down the passage and they're sort of in their head about whatever task they're working on at that particular point in time. And they don't even see the other people walking past them in the passage. Um, interesting, in, a, in, a, in an African context, that's very, that, that very often runs along race lines. And, um, and from, a, from a sort of an African perspective, it's very rude to walk past somebody in a passage and not greet them. Um, and not just, you know, even just stop and say, say hi, and, you know, how's your day going and stuff like that. Um, and I think what they're trying to what they're trying to get to is a point where the the benefits of working together in a team and uh, and feeling like you're part of a team means that you're more motivated, more inspired, um, more creative. I think that's a very big part of it is kind of trying to um, bring people's creativity out and um, and that you're able to make a bigger impact um, a bigger impact in that way. Um, 
but yeah, like I say, it's 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 met with very mixed um, responses. I think because it jars up so hardly again, so so strongly against um, the way that that a lot of people work and and see what you know how work should be done. Yuda, you have your hand up. Would you like to say something? Um, yeah, so I, um, it's kind of, um, would, I mean, I completely agree with and what you said, and I'm maybe coming from it from a different angle. Um, it's, I believe we, we can build staff acceptance. I believe that future work will maybe be much more digital or have a strong digital component or even new um, staff, like staff position dis descriptions. Um, but what we really need to achieve is that these infrastructure actually provide um, are of help to people and um, provide new opportunities and are re really um, opening possibilities for them um, and provide a way that people working on a digital system can immediately see the result um, in a wider context. For example, you are entering your uh, digitized specimens into the infrastructure and you immediately see um, your collection size growing in the GBFRES registry, you see um, your specimens be allocated to virtual collections all over the place and uh, being used by, by other users. So I'm still thinking about these questions about if you of having an, an infrastructure that is actually um, trying to do too much and trying to reach too many users and fitting their um, requirements and preferences. And um, afterwards I thought it's actually um, quite similar to what somebody said in, uh, well, for me in the morning or early in the afternoon during the knowledge graph session where, um, I'm not sure, maybe Steve Baskov said that RDF, um, so these triplets um, are actually not solving any problems, but they put everything on the table. So this is kind of how I see uh, digital work and digital infrastructures is a way to put everything on the table and then you actually can shape different like uh, interfaces, uh, user experience um, very specifically to what people need and that would help people enjoy, well enjoy, but um, remove obstacles of people interacting with the uh, infrastructure and seeing it as a help and not an additional workload. So. so I have a question that came in from the Q and A. Um, Jorit would like to talk about the difference of collaboration between large projects and institutions and smaller, more specialized communities. So what is a non-digital success story of cross-disciplinary, cross-institutional collaboration? That sounds like one for Vince. <laughs> I mean, I think you could look at almost, you know, a, a myriad of different conventional research projects right now. I mean, the, the, the nature of the work that we do has always been collaborative. We have shared specimens, we have written letters. Um, the Natural History Museum archive, um, the physical archive provides this enormous network of sort of patterns of communication at a time pre-digital. 
Um, and, and that work still goes on. It just goes on, you know, via email and, and things like that. I think the point is that we're trying to make a, a, a digital transformation that enables many more possibilities around our collection, creates all these new opportunities. And the frustration, you know, um, to sort of Yuta's point is that we're not there yet. Um, many of these infrastructures, um, you know, they uh, are, are a work in progress and there's still a lot more work to do to be able to deliver on those promises. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think you could look at, um, I, I see, you know, my own, a lot of my non-digital colleagues at Natural History Museum London are still engaged in all sorts of research that are, is not really very digital. Digital could help them, and there's a kind of a, 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 an effort to kind of point out where those digital interventions would make their life easier. Um, but, but the, you know, look at almost any uh, journal that's not digitally available. Amazingly, there's still a world of publications out there that are, are not digitally accessible, and you'll see a wealth of physical sharing. Um, I mean, Natural History Museum London, for example, we're still sending pre-COVID 70,000 specimens a year to people. That's a very physical thing. So I think there's a wealth of non-digital work where there's lots of collaboration. We just got to try and help that transition to uh, be digital where we can usefully add value. And sometimes we can't because the infrastructures are not developed or because um, you know we, we haven't um, we haven't figured out that digital piece yet. I think I would just ditto what you just said. And um, I think one of the things that we're aiming to do is figure out how you balance those tasks and demand of, demands on time, especially for people that are already having to work across many types of roles within their single role. And what we're hoping is that the community effort building that we're doing both internally and externally and the partnerships we can build kind of lessens the load on the individual, which would be nice. Maybe if I could add one point, which is I think sometimes digital doesn't scale well. So for some tasks, there's kind of a linear progression, but for a lot of the things that we need, we need a little piece of someone's skills and time on a particular topic. And that's often a hard thing to do within an organization or a community. And the problem actually is we often infinitesimally slice people's time to get that a little bit more. And those people um, ultimately break because they don't scale in that way. So digital has some problems scaling and growing. Um, but again, that's where community is important because maybe by reaching across boundaries, building those bridges, we can reach people who you know are not in our own institution but have those skill sets and maybe that bit more time. Deb, did you want to add to that? I mean, I'm not sure it gets exactly at the bigger question that Jorit is asking, but it's one aspect. And some of you will have heard this example before, but others will not. Um, and maybe somebody can put a link in the chat. The W3C schools, um, and this is like mm, 2013 or so, they did this sort of analysis of their working groups. And they basically said, what can we do to make our working groups more effective? Uh, to have a broader reach, to have more impact, um, and not just be something that was known to them inside their own group. And there were basically two findings. And these are these can be counterintuitive to people that are used to working in a world of expertise, where their first notion is go grab all the experts who know about this stuff, and then you've done your then you've done a good job, and you're like, yeah, I'm done. So the two points are. It is important in every working group to have someone who is not a subject matter expert. That person is a reality check for the materials that you're putting out, for what you're saying, are you communicating, can people understand it? Um, and the other part of that is have someone whose role in the working group is to look outward from the working group. 
not inward to what are we trying to accomplish, but who is it that we need to be talking to? Is that better? Thank you. Somebody's letting me know my sound was too soft. Um, letting me this notion of um, are we communicating to the groups that are our need to liaison with what we're doing? And is there somebody whose job that is? And so those two roles were, were often missing from their working groups. Um, so those provide perhaps a little bit of insight to your question, Yorit, which is a very big one. Go ahead. I look like you tell you were gonna. Yeah. Um, I, I'm as, like for non-digital success stories, I'm thinking about IPBS. Um, the reports they produce, they are always transdisciplinary. And um, yeah, that's where very different communities come together and coordinate to produce these reports. Um, yeah, different communities in kind of all kinds of dimensions and they are amazing. So um, that is kind of why, well, and the collections community um, is part of that. Um, so, and it's something where I think, so yeah, that's where we also belong and where our, our infrastructure actually belongs. So, but that is something where I think that works really well. It's pretty amazing. So, thanks. Um, kind of actually building from what you were saying, Deb, we had a question planned ahead of time. Um, I'm going to pose now. Um, and I think this is a particularly applicable given that we're at Tadwig and the way that Tadwig functions um, of how do we balance trying to be inclusive and staying connected with the broader environment with sometimes requiring a high level of expertise to make progress. And I, I think many of you shared ways of doing that, whether you did it intentionally or not. I saw that in the talks that you were given of multiple ways of entering into these environments. And contributing. Well, I certainly gave you one. Right, the W3 schools model is certainly, that's something I try to take to the working groups I've been part of, um, but other people here must have other insights. Can I, can I go really quick? Um, yeah. I'll just say, so we started the Paleo Data Working Group in May of 2020, and it, long story, long sort of progression before that at Biodiversity Next, Holly and Erica and a few of Deb and a few of us were talking about how we really needed more paleo people involved. The working group got started and COVID happened and all this stuff. And then Tadwig happened online last fall. And it was so awesome to see so many of our happy hour people in Tadwig online. And then we would go back and have a discussion like, okay, did, you know, did anybody have questions? Like, did you see cool stuff? We have um, a channel in our Slack workspace for conferences where people can share like, hey, I saw this talk, it was really awesome. Um, and so I think just making it more available, like maybe as a paleo collections manager, you wouldn't pay a lot of money to go to a Tadwig meeting, but having it accessible online last year, I feel like we saw a big engagement with our community who may not be the most tech savvy. Some of us are very tech savvy and some folks are not very tech savvy, um, but I definitely saw increased engagement in our community. I don't know if Holly, you want to add anything? I think you covered it well. I agree. And also kind of what Deb was saying, having those people that can connect you out to the other ones that carry the group's message kind of along with them, I think is a really powerful way of doing it. The act strategic placement of actors is what one of our internal people keeps saying. <laughs> um, 
I think there's a recognition, and I can speak to this from the IDIG bio point of view, and then post IDIG bio in my, my new role for the species file group as community liaison, um, Kelsey Yule at NEON, um, I'll think of some other people here in just a second, uh, but this notion of playing this role, like having this position is the open source community. This is in my talk, it's a precursor, <laughs> a spoiler alert on Wednesday, um, but this notion of having someone whose job it is to build these bridges and having that be your role. Vince was talking about the consistently splitting somebody into more and more pieces. That's not really great. Um, somebody else alluded to, when you talk about making this sustainable, Holly, like the, the notion of doing workshops. Was it you who said that, Ian? I mean, you, you have this cycle that can go where, well, the people that got trained are no longer there, are no longer in the system. So that was gonna make me at some point bring up the carpentries. You need a model that you're, when you're talking about, whether it's the people or the model that the people are in, that they can maintain it and pass on this information and this, this knowledge transfer and um, so that you have inclusiveness, but you also have this expertise sharing in a way that's sustainable and manageable. So Deb, just building on that a little bit, one of the things I think I've really, or has been really successful for our happy hour working group is the fact that it's on Zoom and it's virtual. And so we're not waiting to connect in a meeting every year that's maybe very expensive to go to. So we have this, we have the engagement of a lot of early career professionals and even students, mm -hmm. um, graduate students that come to our happy hour sessions that may not have been engaging. And I think that's really helped with sustainability, or at least that's my hope is that, you know, we're it, it's like a constant, you know, there's people always coming in or somebody gets a different job and leaves the community and there's always somebody new coming in. And I think Zoom has really helped to like, I don't know, make that more sustainable in some ways. You, you've democratized the community. You've made it peer to peer. This is something that the Carpentries would talk about. Instead of having an expert at the top of the room saying, I know all this stuff and I'm here to dump it into your head, you've made it this collaboration, which is a comfortable space for people, right? Then they can say things like, I don't know, or I don't understand, and they feel safe to do that, and they can feel safe to reach out as well. So we're running low on time, so I want to make sure we had a chance to um, answer the question from um, Huva. Um, and Abigail was wondering, how would we measure the success of our communities of practice? I guess sustainability would be one, but um, if anyone has any additional thoughts. Deb? Ian, you were gonna say something. I see that look on your face. Your turn. Yeah, okay. So yes, I mean, I think it's I think it's a very difficult thing to uh, you know, to, to maybe measure quantitatively. Um, so I'm I'm still a bit uncertain about this sort of concept of communities of practice because it sounds very formal, and um, and as soon as you're talking about community and there's formality, um, it kind of starts to um, doesn't sort of gel so well. And um, so people have been talking about starting communities of practice for biodiversity data management in South Africa for a long time, but I haven't really seen anything. I'm like, you know, where's the community? Um, but um, a lot of, you know, a lot of what we do is we, this kind of community stuff kind of develops spontaneously, you know, when there's an opportunity to sort of form um, a particular group and it looks like there's going to be cohesiveness within that group and um, and a good kind of dynamic within the group um, then you know we, we we try to try try to start something and to be honest it it's like it's it's like just how do you feel about it do you feel this thing is working or not um, and um, yeah you know I mean you can run polls and things like that you know we've done that in the past um, as well you know sort of asking people you know, do you think this community is working? But then all the people that like the community say, yes, it's working. And the ones that don't just don't reply. So um, yeah, so it's, I think it is difficult. Anybody else? 
I'll, I'll shout four things out really quick and without too many details. One, NHM putting Vince on the spot would think they did a sort of museum wide assessment of skills needs as part of their several part effort to speed up digitization. And the, the idea was that sure, we can take images faster, but we also need skills and we need other, we need more technology, et cetera. So they had to have a baseline. And so there's a metric at which you could measure how your community of practice changes affect your, your skills based. You'd have a basic, a baseline and then something which to measure against. Um, another one is the carpentry's assessment tools. They ask some sort of social assessment questions, you know, how do you feel about this now? You know, would you be more likely to try it or not after experiencing this as well as concrete, you know, can you do this now as opposed to before? Um, the third thing is the digitization maturity model that comes out of the Atlas of Living Australia, um, which gives an, a nice way at an organizational level to measure sort of attitude ideas about thinking. And the fourth thing is hard, as you point out, Ian, but it is interesting to people like, like the National Science Foundation. They want to know if funding digitization in a collection, like let's say in the insect collection, and let's say it's a, an institution with multiple collection types. They want to know if because they funded that, did digitization and the culture of digitizing, the quality of data, data input, data skills and knowledge, um, the attitudes about doing that work, does that spread to other um, collections? Um, and so that's, you can measure it in some concrete ways and the other ways, like you said, are more are behavioral attitude type questions. One concrete example of an, an instance where it didn't work uh, to make the point. Somebody had a question um, in, I can't share my data because Darwin Core doesn't handle quadrinomials. That was the question. And that was in one collection type. And when I went to visit and this question came up, I thought to myself, but wait a minute, right across the hall, there's this other collection type and they're like longtime members of Tadwig and experts in the Darwin Core standards, but this collection type wasn't talking to this collection type at all. So they had a data question and they had a data need and, and the expertise was right across the hall for that. So yeah, those are things that you could measure. I don't know. Vince, do you have any, that NHM stuff you did? Can you? We have lots of metrics of success that, I mean, and it depends on the question and the, the, the thing you're trying to do. It's really all about outcomes, really. What outcome are you trying to develop? And um, therefore, what are the logical metrics associated with that? Um, and, you know, for example, digitization at the moment for us, it's all about acceleration. How much can we up that curve? Uh, so that improve our um, uh, our rate of acceleration um, uh, in digitization, for example, um, you know, when we have specific outcomes, um, uh, you know, across our sort of informatic strategy, if you like, that we're trying to deliver on. I think, I mean, one thing I would like to touch on is, uh, which was previously read, is what do you do when a community is failing? Or where do you draw the line? Because exactly as Ian said, there's often a lot of nice words and apathy uh, by some members of the community and maybe one or two individuals who are really driving things, but um, it's not getting anywhere. And saying, okay, time for change um, is really, really hard. And um, that is something that actually I'm grappling with in something right now. And uh, it's a really, a really tough one to pick up and address. I don't have good answers for that. I don't have a good answer either, but we were just having this discussion about something else internally in the um, long-standing statement of, but this is just how we've done it. <laughs> and how that should, someone saying that should be the moment that they have to change. <laughs> Or at least review, yeah. Um, Vince, I don't know if this really answers your question, but we had a really active paleo digitization working group from IDIG Bio from like 2013 to 2017. And it was, you know, all the big digitization grants were being funded and we did tons of webinars and workshops. And then we all kind of just like lost momentum. 
And like, I think I personally got really burnt out and like, it just, it kind of stopped. And I think it was good that we kind of paused for a couple of years and then we re-engaged in the fall of 2019. And this really great thing came out of it with these happy hour sessions. And so I think sometimes like you kind of have to take those breaks to refresh and not be afraid to, you know, if something's not working, just say, we're just going to, you know, put this in the freezer for a little bit and forget about it. And, you know, then maybe we'll compost it and start over or maybe we'll defrost it. I don't know. But I think we have to not be afraid to, to put a pause on things sometimes and rethink them. I like that notion. Um, and unfortunately, we are now out of time. <laughs> Uh, we had a few other questions that we might end up posting in one of these community forums or something. I think there might be more opportunities to talk about this through the week. So look out for that. Um, but uh, unless anyone else has any last words that they want to share as we wrap up. I would say come to that panel discussion that's tomorrow, challenges in curating interdisciplinary data in the biodiversity research community. It's directly related to, or to what was going on in this conversation. For sure. Thanks. Great. Okay, well, um, once again, I want to thank all of the speakers. Uh, your talks were great. I'm excited for this conversation to continue and to collaborate with all of you. Um, <laughs> so thank you for joining our session and thank you to all the attendees as well. Um, if anyone came in late or missed part of the session, it will be available online on the platform for on-demand viewing and of course the Whova chat and questions will remain there as well, and you can continue to interact with those. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to you, Holly and Rebecca, for organizing. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. I was going to say the same. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. That was great.